right, good evening everyone. Um, thank you for coming to tonight's um, second of two um, uh, walking tours and informational session talking about um, the Buttle Street um, Road Diet and specifically the Indian and Buttle Street Corridor Study that was done a couple of years ago. Um, but thank you all for coming. We do have sign-in sheets in the back, so if you have not a chance to sign in, we would ask that you would please um, put your name um, and information there so we have an accurate record of the number of people that attended this evening. Um, it's a little bit different this week than we had last week, Thursday. We do have recording taking place because we want to be able to record this and then be able to play it for anyone that wasn't able to attend. So even though this is a info session, it's going to have a little bit more formality for those that may have attended on last week, Thursday. Um, with that being said, um, some of the things I kind of want to point out for um, tonight's um, agenda. One, I should probably introduce myself. Um, I'm Grant Marshall. I'm the Director of Planning for the City of Midland. And I did host um, with uh, the staff um, last week um, the input session. And so what you'll hear this evening is very similar to what was um, presented at last week's um, info session. So with me this evening, um, I do have Selena Tisdell, the city's community affairs director, Brett Kay, the city manager. Um, we have uh, Nicole Wilson, our community development planner, and then Katie Geyer, our communication specialist. We also have Lieutenant Mike Sokol with us this evening and is going to be able to talk a little bit about the accident data and what the police department is looking at in relation to that. So, um, so yes, we do have some good staff resources here, but with that, I do want to jump into the presentation. We'll have kind of three elements of tonight's um, info session. First will be a staff presentation that will go on for about 30 minutes. Um, after that, we have a walking tour, which will be out within the corridor. Um, we'll highlight a little bit of a map, but we'll encourage all of you to go out and um, utilizing clipboards and um, input um, cards that we do have, be able to go out into the corridor and walk through and have some observations about the pedestrian experience, as well as the traffic experience that's out there. Following that, we'll then reconvene back in this chamber and we'll have an opportunity to talk about those observations that we did see out in the corridor. So each of those will take right around 30 minutes, we estimate. Um, we were right on with 30 minutes on, on Thursday, so we're hoping to keep that same schedule tonight. <clears throat> but what's the reason why we're here? And a lot of this kind of uh, dates back um, uh, really to a corridor study that was done by the Michigan Department of Transportation back in 2015. It concluded in 2017. And it looked at the entire corridor from Washington Street on the east all the way up to Airport Road on the north. Um, this is US 10 business route through the city limits. And so that was the corridor study that was done at the time, um, commissioned by MDOT through the consulting help of MKSK and uh, DLZ consulting firms. More specifically, some um, kind of may have wanted to come and talk specifically about tonight's, uh, or not tonight, but, but rather an ongoing trial that's taken place since May, uh, which is a nine block test area of this corridor study. So this is uh, what's being called the Buttle Street Road Diet trial area. And that is, of course, the nine blocks stretching from Jerome down to State Street, where we have a lane closure and or orange bollards that are out uh, within one of the lanes. <clears throat> but to set the context for all of this, we do kind of have to go back a little bit more to really the history of downtown Midland planning and be able to get a broader understanding of why we're talking about streets in our downtown and how that relates to planning initiatives and other planning uh, concepts that have been pursued by the city uh, for a number of, of years. And so when we began to think about our downtown, one of the things that staff thinks about and we've, we talk about frequently with planning is um, uh, our street network, but also the land uses and things that are in between our street network. And so you have the historic Main Street of downtown, really stretching from M20 down to Poseyville Road Bridge, uh, where the heart and soul really of Midland has been for a number of years since uh, the founding of the city. But with the historic, or the historic Main Street, we've had iterations of expansion of our downtown to, con uh, to be uh, more than just um, retail and other types of uses. We've had other mix of uses, commercial uses that have expanded out to the one-way pairs which is, and down to the riverfront um, that you see here in the orange polygon on the map. And then in the, city, in the city's 1997 master plan, you did call for commercial um, and office uses within the area that you see highlighted here in blue, which began to include the one-way pairs of Indian and Buttle Street um, through to Grove Park and then down, um, including areas that's now developed into East End Building and Dow Diamond, um, and as well as, um, uh, well, really all the way down to State Street on the southeast side. 
<coughs> following additional uh, community input and uh, really broad community input that took place at the time, um, there was a series of, of public input strategies that were used by the city to try and get as much public input as possible. Uh, meetings in a box, I don't know if we have anyone in the audience that participated in meetings in a box, but that was done back through 2005 and 6 in order to get to the city's 2007 master plan, which began to envision a much more expanded, modern downtown um, uh, district, which includes all of the area that you see highlighted here. So you have, of course, Main Street within that, and then the expanded area to uh, Buttle Street, and then beginning in 2007, uh, really envisioning a, a type of mixture of uses and an expanded downtown, um, including areas of the ballpark, Dow Diamond, and the one-way pairs of Indian and Buttles, again, to Grove Park, all the way up to uh, where Indian and Buttles form Eastman Avenue. <coughs> This is important to, um, to planners, but also to um, city council and other decision makers when it comes to new development that's taking place within the corridor because uh, the way that we've, uh, that the, the vision of the master plan for the city uh, for downtown um, is stated is really to um, encapsulate really a, a variety of uses, but expanding, enhancing the vibrancy of downtown by adding additional density, mixed use developments, and expanding to incorporate the ballpark area. So this is the verbiage that's right out of the city's master plan that was part of that development back um, in the 2000s. So from a, a planning perspective, and when we think about the types of decision making that goes into how we craft a downtown district, of course you have public actors like the city um, that have control over um, some of the things that take place within our community. Um, things like the master plan, um, public spaces, street right of ways, as well as zoning regulations. All those things are done uh, through public processes and eventually create um, frameworks or rather visions for areas of, of the city. Of course, we have private property, and by and large, that shapes through private market forces, all within the, con the confines and really the framework that's developed through a zoning ordinance. One of the things that we may not think about as kind of a public space within our city is street right-of-ways. And effectively, we do have corridors throughout our entire uh, city that, by and large, facilitate vehicle traffic. But um, really, for the last 20 years or so, cities have begun to think of these a little bit differently. And they're not just solely for vehicle traffic, but they're also to facilitate other people, other types of uses um, in other communities that might be um, fixed route transit or buses and that type of thing. In Midland, it's, it's more than just streets or, or more than traffic. It's pedestrians and bicyclists, other types of users that may be using the corridor and are um, wanting it to be more than simply just a place that facilitates car traffic. So now let's get back to uh, the, the, the corridor study done between 2015 and 2017. Um, this is a document that is actually out on the city's website, and it's a, a little bit of a light read. Um, it's actually 500 and, I believe 572 pages, 42 pages um, of information that dives very deeply into the types of traffic analysis that was completed as part of the study. Um, it goes into the input sessions that were done as part of developing the final alternatives and the open houses that were conducted at that time by MDOT and their consultant partners. Um, it goes into a variety of modeling and other types of uh, analysis that traffic engineers use in order to develop uh, concepts that they deem to be viable alternatives for, um, for the corridor. And again, this is a corridor study that looks from not just the small area of downtown, but the area from Washington Street all the way up to Airport Road. So within the study itself, if you read the executive su summary, which I think is only 17 pages at the beginning, I'm a little bit shorter of a read, but it does talk about what's the purpose of this study and what's the objectives that we're trying to have as a result of, of going through this study um, and what could we realize as part of implementation of some of the recommendations. And so the first one was uh, accommodating traffic, making sure that we have adequate accommodations for existing as well as future traffic. Uh, make sure that we have uh, enhanced safety for all modes of transportation, not just vehicles, but for pedestrians and bicyclists that are choosing to use this corridor. Increase the connectivity to the surrounding neighborhoods, specifically talking about the historic district and um, Midtown. Improve non-motorized mobility. Implement context-sensitive design and then support economic development within the corridor. I'm going to spend a little bit of time kind of diving a little bit into detail on each one of these. Um, but again, these are the six objectives that were are identified for the purpose of this study. 
One other thing I do want to provide as part of the context is a concept called complete streets um, policies. And that's something that MDOT's actually had since the mid-2000s um, via an executive order by Jennifer Granholm, Governor Granholm. Um, and the city of Midland actually also has a complete streets policy that was adopted back in June of 2010. And what that means is that when you're planning for a road, you're not just simply thinking about automobiles, but you're thinking about a whole holistic type of users that could be using that corridor. So making sure that the sidewalks are in good shape, that you have adequate um, ADA accessibility ramps down at the intersections, um, thinking about other types of users, whether that would be bicyclists that could be using it for on-street bicycle um, facilities. But all of that is packaged into a concept called complete streets, which is really about broadening the horizons of how we're thinking about planning for uh, corridors within our community. I did mention that there was public involvement within that 2015 to 2017 study, and that's important because with corridor studies like this, there's an element of public engagement. And so um, there were actually multiple input sessions that were held as part of it, one of which was on December uh, 14th of uh, 2016, held in this room, where members of the public were able to come and provide their input related to um, not only the direction of the study early on, but also kind of the final concepts that were coming out of that study to really get their feedback on some of the alternatives that were being proposed. With the corridor study, there is a steering committee that's formulated, and that's to capture the large stakeholders that exist along the corridor. And so in this particular case, we did have a steering committee that included representation from MDOT as well as the City of Midland, including our Downtown Development Authority and our Non-Motorized Transportation Committee. We had Discovery Square, which was represented by the Center for the Arts, the Business Alliance at the time, the Chamber of Commerce in Midland Tomorrow, the Michigan Baseball Foundation, and then the Midland Area Community Foundation. So now we'll dive a little bit more into uh, the focus of the downtown study. The, uh, the polygon you see in yellow here is the extent of the city's downtown development authority district. And so this is a district that was expanded back um, in the latter parts of the 2000s to include some additional areas. But what you see here is all of that area that is um, under the downtown development authority's um, uh, regulation or auspices. So I said I'd dive a little bit into each one of those objectives. So we'll start with traffic and safety being uh, some of the first two. So looking at traffic and safety, uh, the study identified that there's excess capacity within the current design and that traffic speed must be slowed in order to improve the non-motorized experience as well as improve the context sensitive design of the corridor. It also identified that if we're um, talking about corridor changes, we need to think about how the safety can be improved uh, for all users and can't be dis uh, decreased. So ways we've gone about measuring that, um, by and large, that is what's um, being measured as part of the road diet trial currently. And so um, looking at traffic flow monitoring, monitoring, traffic speed analysis, intersection performance, as well as corridor crash data. When it comes to traffic speed, there's the traffic speed analysis being conducted by MDOT. And then we do have the corridor safety um, element, which is looking at vehicle crashes, as well as bicycles and, and pedestrians. Thankfully, we have not had any during the trial study with um, those two user groups. Um, but that is being monitored not only by MDOT, but also by the city and specifically the city police department. So with that, when it comes to the accident data, some of the things we do want to point out, and Lieutenant Sokol's coming up to add some more commentary to this, but um, for looking at prior years, we have seen an increase in the number of crashes that have taken place. Um, but one thing we do want to talk about is that we need to talk more about really the details of those accidents and how um, we can't simply look at the aggregate data. We may need to look more into the data to see really what it's, what's telling us. Um, so I do have Lieutenant Sokol here that's going to talk a little bit about how they go about uh, collecting that information and then providing it to um, City Council. Correct. And so my understanding is uh, the prior um, meeting there was uh, some MDOT members there with the statistics. And uh, so I kind of am here to explain where those statistics come from. Uh, they come from us. Uh, we get called to uh, a crash at, uh, at, at an intersection or wherever and uh, we, we, the officer goes and gathers the data. The data, data ga are gathered is from both drivers and witnesses if possible. Um, the, the information uh, normally asked is, you know, basically your basics of what happened, um, seat belts, uh, cell phone devices, other technical devices that are maybe distracting, if you were distracted or if you were, you were paying attention, and as well as uh, gather uh, witness statements. Um, those are then, that information is then gathered by the officer with, with also looking at the vehicles and the damage. Um, 
and then uh, a report called the UD-10 uh, is filled out. That report is uh, approved and then forwarded on to the state, and that's where they gather their data from. Uh, as, as in anything, um, the data is only as good as it is from what, when we get from the people. Um, most people, if they're on their cell phones when they're involved in a crash, will not openly tell us they're on a cell phone. Um, so a lot, so, like, so, but no, but seriously, because I've gone to a lot of seminars where they're trying to get that information, make sure that, ac that information is accurate, and that information, it's, it's just tough to get, because it, unless we have an old witness saying that they actually saw them on a cell phone, then we cannot put that on the UD-10. Um, if someone is actually distracted, they're afraid to say that they were distracted, because they're afraid that they might get in some more trouble. Um, so we can't put that they were, uh, you know, we've, seen, we've all seen them reading the books, uh, eating cheeseburgers, in, 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 in all seriousness, that, that's a lot of stuff in the distractions within the vehicle that we're not getting that information from. We'd love to get it. Unfortunately, it's just, it's, sometimes it's just not there. Um, so again, that's the information we, we gather and, and, and that's what we, we put in. So we're not, you know, we're not trying to make anything up. We, we come in as a complete, uh, we, we come into a scene as a complete unknown and we have to figure out the scenes uh, once we get there. And then so this is where the data is gathered um, and, and then we, we determine on these crashes, they give us, they give us different options on, on which way the vehicles are moving, uh, angle crashes, uh, straight crashes. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll use an example of an angle straight. An angle straight is someone running a red light and then the person going the other way and they, they T-bone. It's a straight T-bone. That's what an angle straight is. Um, bicycle, obviously fixed objects. In order for a crash report to be, in order for a person to officially contact the police department, the, the crash, the damage has to be over a thousand dollars. Okay, so that's another way of, of maybe, you know, things aren't being reported. Is if, if, if two people get into a crash, they pull over to the side of the road and they determine that there's less damage than a thousand dollars, they legally don't have to report it to us. Um, and then obviously, uh, if it's over $1,000 or if there's a personal injury, it's required to report to us. Um, single motor vehicle crashes are, is just that. Someone's sliding <coughs> off and striking uh, a fixed object causing damage. Uh, rear end straight, that's someone that just straight up not paying attention and hits them in, in, in the rear end. Um, and then I think there's a rear end angle. Um, but that's something where they're turning and they, they angle it while they're turning. So those are just some of the violations. Those are some of the things that we look at. Uh, once we get to a scene. Some of the, the, the offenses uh, that are some of the offenses or the citations that we would write, um, it, that determines, that's determined by the officer's uh, investigation, witnesses, and sometimes if we don't have witnesses and one person's saying one thing and another person's saying the other, we can't come into determination by even looking at the crash. That happens as well. That happens a lot with, the, with uh, some red light violations where someone says they had the green light, other person says they had a green light. We have no witnesses, and so we, we weren't there. We can't, we can't make that determination. Um, driving the wrong way, fail to stop. Um, that's, I, I believe the fail to stop at an accident, that's going to be your, uh, your rear ends, unable to stop uh, at, at an accident where you're, um, obviously the person behind them, uh, the, the vehicle in front stops, and the person just can't react to time, and they rear end. That's a lot of those. And um, the improper turns, improper lane usages are the, which is what we have a lot of up here at the, at, on Buttles, is just the, the lane changes. Um, again, if we talk to the drivers, you know, they will not tell us what was actually happening in the vehicle. They will say they just didn't see that car. And so that's where the improper lane usage goes. Um, and then obviously the run, the run red lights, uh, speed too fast for conditions. That's usually the single motor vehicles that just uh, speed up and, and, and run off. Um, off the road. Oops. I, you know, I said overall impact, and I was going to just do this overall impact for our, our department. Um, I think after looking at the numbers, it, it adds, it added about mm, a half crash a month um, between, you know, if you go from month to month. Um, and so it, there's, there's, there really hasn't been that much of an impact on our, on our department as far as uh, hours spent out here policing crashes and, and things of that nature. Um, but uh, that's just, you know, again, what, I'll, I'll just go by what the numbers say. That it's, the, the numbers go up and down um, at intersections throughout the city. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you.
And so as part of the ongoing data collection efforts, of course, the police department is forwarding those on, like you heard him say, to the state, and then MDOT's being able to pull that information, and that's all being provided to city council. Uh, the two charts that you saw him present, that was actually information presented back to city council uh, during their meeting on May 20th. And so um, that information, again, is also available out on the city's website in that agenda packet. When you look at uh, the next couple of uh, purposes of the study, uh, we begin to dive into um, some things that maybe aren't as quantifiable, but they certainly are um, very legitimate when it comes to planning theory and other um, best practices that have been seen across the country. Um, and so two of those are include connectivity and non-motorized mobility. And when we look at downtown's connectivity, simply from a really a street grade uh, or street grid perspective, you of course have one-way pairs of Indian and Buttles in the dark lines. Uh, you have Cronkite and George that form uh, Poseyville Road. You have, of course, M20 uh, corridor that extends um, and heads out to the west towards Mount Pleasant. You have the one-way pairs of Ashman and Rod uh, that circle in closer to the center part of the city. And then you, of course, have neighborhoods that do extend um, near to downtown and um, are in very close proximity, including what's becoming known as Midtown, and then the historic district just on the other side of M20, uh, where we have our historic um, district commission. Not only is it important to think of connectivity in terms of vehicle traffic, but also in non-motorized traffic, so bicycles and pedestrians, and specific on-street facilities that exist in this area include the, one, uh, the bike path through the one-way pairs, um, through the Grand Curve Park, uh, as well as uh, uh, path pathways that do wrap around Down Diamond and eventually continue on down to the Tridge um, and out to Chippewa Nature Center and um, the Pier Marquette Rail Trail. Not only do we have um, off-street uh, facilities, we also have on-street facilities and we have Ashman and Rod uh, with shared lanes, which you see highlighted here in orange. Um, we have dedicated bike lanes on Ellsworth as well as on McDonald and a dedicated, or rather a dedicated bike route on McDonald and Grove, uh, continuing on, on Haley and also on Fitzhugh um, into the interior parts of Midtown. Uh, context sensitive design and then economic development are kind of the two uh, last uh, objectives of the study itself. And when we think about context sensitive design, um, some of the things uh, that come to mind and kind of a way to explain context sensitive design is how is the road um, influencing or having possibly a detrimental or a positive impact on the surrounding area. And so when you look through the corridor, and this is really what we're trying to kind of express this evening and why we want to do a walking tour, is um, have folks recognize um, what the, the impact of the roadway has been over a long period of time on the adjacent neighborhood. And so when you drive down India and you see a lot of, of grassed areas, properties that are vacant today, um, they weren't always vacant. There were houses there or businesses that were there previously. On Buttle Street, a little bit different. You're closer into downtown. You have some newer commercial development, as you see here with the MBA building, as well as the Edder Insurance building. Um, but by and large, you just still have some vacant lots um, that are there as well. But when we think back to a number of years ago, in the, into the early 2000s and prior to that, um, our streets looked very similar to some of the other streets that we did see in other, or that still exist in other communities. Uh, the one-way pairs of three-lane streets, that's not unique to Midland. It's a technique that was utilized in a lot of other communities and still is in existence today, including M25 through Bay City. You also have the one-way pairs of Davenport and State Street down in Saginaw on M58 that do have a very similar style of of traffic and some of the ways we think about context sensitive design is well, what is the influence of the speed of traffic on the surrounding properties? Are there certain types of uses that may not want to locate there because of the speed of traffic or the types of vehicles that are moving through that corridor? Um, and one of the things we did see and experience as a community was lack of investment through a lot of those homes that were within those one-way pairs. And a lot of times um, you can find that there's actually negative impacts of high-speed corridors through downtowns as a result of, of those detrimental impacts and having an influence on uh, the amount of investment that either takes place or does not take place. <clears throat> when we think about um, the economic development piece, um, and rather, I guess I maybe back up here and think about the economic development piece. If we go back to the vision that's really envisioned by the city's master plan for mixed use development, um, other types of shops, res uh, retail, maybe um, restaurant spaces, um, office spaces, as well as residential, um, all of that type of environment is something that's really conductive or conducive to um, a little bit of a, a slower road as well as a, maybe not as uh, wide of a street. And so um, some of the elements of the study 
And um, some of the conclusions that were drawn is that there could be potential economic development um, opportunities that take place if you have a corridor that speaks more to that and reinforces um, some of those design provisions that are um, more conducive to that style of, of development. We do have ways in which we measure more of these goals um, when it comes to the context sensitive design and the connectivity as well as non-motorized transportation. Uh, first one being importance of the pedestrian safety and incident reporting, again um, done through the city um, police department as well as MDOT. Um, we also begin to look at uh, the final design of a two-lane um, two profile, and one of the things we do want to point out is even though there's been concepts that's been floated around for a potential bike lane, um, a lot of those were just uh, very conceptual concepts that were put into the plan. A final design of that corridor has not been determined, um, and the final design ultimately is what would influence the experience of the pedestrians and provide some additional uh, benefits to them um, going in the corridor but also crossing that corridor. Again, pointing out the fact that we have mixed use um, land that's, that's planned for that area. And so one measurement would be the types of new developments that are taking place, the amount, um, the value of those that are being invested into the city. And again, looking at it from um, an infill mixed use development type of perspective, um, which not only is valuable to take properties that are currently vacant or maybe were underutilized or obsolete previously, but changing them into a higher and better use, all that of course has a very high return on investment for the public sector because all of your utilities, all of your other types of infrastructure are there, you're not having to expand it, and you're able simply to capitalize on, on property that just has higher value to it. So when we dive a little bit deeper into uh, the, the specific results of the corridor study, some of these concepts um, and uh, images you may have seen um, previously, uh, the top one is the preferred alternative that was the result of the study. Um, but I do want to point out the fact that the study not only looked at just a two-lane profile, it looked at whether or not the roads should stay as they are, um, or whether or not it'd be feasible to have Buttle Street and Indian Street go to five-lane roads where you would have a center turn lane and two lanes of traffic in either direction, which you see depicted here in alter alternative two. Uh, the third alternative was having Buttle Street uh, go to two-way traffic with a center turn lane and then expanding Indian Street to a five-lane profile with a center turn lane with two travel lanes in each direction. Um, ultimately, alternative two and alternative three uh, were not determined as the preferred alternative for a variety of reasons, some of which were uh, the expense in needing to acquire additional right-of-way in order to allow for a, a five-lane profile. The right-of-way distance and width that's there currently simply would not allow for that many lanes of traffic whether you're on Duddles or on Indian. <clears throat> One of the things too that was pointed out in the study and I think um, has been talked about a lot is this idea of non-motorized use that you see highlighted here within yellow. Um, that was an alternative that was proposed as part of the study, but again, the final design of the corridor has not been determined. So whether that would be used as pedestrian space or if it would be used as simply green space or if the road would be centered and you would have turn lanes to um, prominent intersections like Cronkred or possibly Ashman, um, all of those fine details of the design, they have not yet taken place. This is still part of the study that takes what we're in right now or where we find ourselves today is the study happening and having that be ongoing and then ultimately determining what the final design is, is yet to be determined. That would take place into the future. <clears throat> Some other um, concepts that were floated around as well within the study, um, which is, again, more reinforcing of that bike lane idea. Um, in the top image, you do see physical delineation through the use of planters, um, as well as signage and other types of, of um, actual physical delineation, not just on street, but uh, completely separated. Um, in the bottom one, uh, you see more of a physical delineation used through plastic bollards as well as hashing um, through um, the, uh, the pavement markings. Again, that's, that's continued on in some of the other images that were part of that study, um, including simply just maybe a painted lane uh, that would be separated as well. Um, again, though, the final design has not been determined, and as we continue to gain uh, public input through these processes as well as a potential process in the future, uh, we would determine what that, that future area would look like if it was determined to go forward uh, with a two-lane profile. So a couple common misunderstandings um, that we do want to kind of highlight again uh, this evening, some of the frequently things that we have been asked um, at the staff level. 
Uh, first one being, who asked for the study to be done? And one of the things I do want to kind of separate out is there's the 2015-2017 study, and then there's the ongoing road diet trial test. And those are two very separate things, all within really the, the broader picture of the study. Uh, but originally, the 2015 to 2017 study was initiated and commissioned by MDOT. Um, and the current road diet trial, they did present the, the plan and the study to uh, city council and ultimately did have city council's approval to move forward with that road diet trial. Uh, so again, those, the study and the trial, two very separate things. Um, and staff is being very intentional about how we use those words because we don't want to have more mix up or miscommunication um, as it relates to those things. Why do we not see anyone walking in the biking lane or walking or biking in the closed lane? Excuse me. Um, and again, that is uh, because the lane is closed for trial purposes. It's not intended to be a light bike lane as it is today. Therefore, um, it would not be safe. And we certainly aren't encouraging, aren't encouraging people to use that um, because again, it's closed temporarily for uh, study purposes. The orange bollards are unsightly and they do not look attractive in downtown. I think we would agree with that. Um, but again, it's the type of device that's been utilized and determined as part of the temporary lane closure. And again, the final design of the corridor has not been determined. So the final future of a two-lane profile would not be the orange bollards if that were to be ultimately where we land. So that takes us, we're just a little bit over seven o'clock, that does take us to our walking tour this evening. And so uh, we do have clipboards that staff will be passing out here um, as you're able to and, uh, and uh, to get up and walk around um, out on the street and provide some observations. Um, there's some things that we do want you to think about while you're out there. Uh, we recognize that a lot of folks may drive solely through this and so we want them to understand it a little bit differently um, being a pedestrian in that environment and maybe not just a, a, a vehicle driver. Uh, but some of the things that we'd encourage you to look at is look at the scale of the roadway in context with the surrounding development. Um, possibly think about envisioning a two-lane corridor. Take those bollards out um, maybe of the vision and think about what that possibly could, could look like. Um, observe pedestrian and bicycle design features. When we were here on Thursday, we actually had a lot of people that were coming downtown for Tunes by the Tridge, um, as well as a uh, Loons game that was ongoing. So there was a lot of um, bicyclists and, and pedestrians that were walking through. So think about those types of design features and how uh, they currently facilitate uh, pedestrians. Um, observe the vehicle design features as well as the traffic flow. Again, thinking about how vehicles are moving through the corridor. And then lastly is kind of this uh, piece of the economic development as well as the vision of the master plan. And think about what future development could look like and the types of uses that may in fact reinforce more of that vibrant, lively downtown that's envisioned by the city's master plan. After we do that, um, we'll come back here and we'll reconvene for an opportunity to talk about observations that you did, um, that you did see. We do have written comment forums, again, that are on those clipboards. Um, you do have an opportunity on the front page to talk about your observations um, when you go through the corridor. On the back side of the page, we actually have an opportunity to write more about other things, potential questions that you may have or other things that you'd like to talk about. And so we'd encourage you to fill that out. We do want to point out that we do need you to complete, out, complete your name as well as your address in order for us to make those part of the official record. So if you could complete that form in its entirety, including the name and address piece on the back, that would be helpful because then we'll go ahead and collect all of those and they will be transmitted to City Council ahead of their next meeting on this on the, um, in September. So the route that we're wanting to take uh, from here uh, we do have a little bit of a smaller crowd and we have quite a few staff members so we'll try and make sure that a staff member is with each group of people so that if you do have questions while you're out there that will be readily available. Um, but we'll leave here, we'll continue out to Buttles if you go out the main entrance of, of City Hall. We'll go to Buttles Street, we'll continue down to uh, the intersection where Art Cleaners and First State Bank is at at Ashman. We'll cross Ashman all the way to the other side of Indian, walk down that sidewalk all the way to Rod, cross back over to Buttles, and then continue down uh, back to City Hall. And again, at the conclusion of the tour, um, if you'd like to, please, we do welcome you to come back and we would have an opportunity for observations and things to be shared at that time. So with that, I will encourage everyone to, to stand up and grab a clipboard and meet us back out at the, at the street.
right, welcome back everyone. And so we'll move into the third portion of the evening, which is the, um, the observation portion. And so this is where we wanna have an opportunity for um, all of you that were able to go out into the corridor to be able to come up and, and talk about some of the things that you um, observed while you were out there and be able to provide um, that information to staff. Um, we do have Nicole and Katie that will be writing down all of those comments, um, different from the format that we had at last week's meeting, um, and that is because we are, again, recording this, and we need to make sure we have solid audio. Um, but when we do make comments this evening, we are going to ask, I'm going to step aside here, but we'll ask you to come up to this podium. There's a blue mat that we'd like you to stand on, and we would like you to state your name and your address for the record, um, and that way we are able to um, capture all of those comments We'll again write them down, um, but we'll also have them um, via the video and the audio as well. So a um, couple of just reminders um, when it comes to um, civility, we do want you, to, we encourage you to come up and speak, um, but we'd ask that you keep your comments short and concise, um, really to respect other people's times because there may be uh, quite a few in the audience that would like to speak. Um, do see some faces from last week and we'd encourage you that if you did speak during the last meeting on Thursday that you'd let others be able to have that opportunity first. Um, but certainly if there's time allowed between now and 8 o'clock, we'd encourage you to come back up if you had other things that you would like to add. Um, we would certainly discourage you to cheer or applaud after any types of comments, um, but we do want to record this down. Um, and direct those comments to staff as well as to other people within the audience um, since that is who will be recording the information. Um, so the three things that we do want to talk about when it comes to observations, and we'll keep these up on the screen um, to be able to provide that, is observations about the pedestrian experience and the environment that's out there today, observations about vehicle traffic and the roadway, um, and that might be something you've maybe observed if you've, if you've driven that corridor for a number of years um, and would like to provide some observations in that regard. Um, and then lastly, the observations about the future of the corridor. And this is really trying to dive down into why are we talking about this and what are we trying to envision um, as part of a, a better corridor for our community. And so thinking about not only Midland today in 2019, but maybe Midland in 2030 or Midland in 2040 and years into the future when uh, most of us might be doing different things, um, but we certainly want Midland to be the best community it can be for many generations to come like it has been for a number of generations uh, to date. So with that, I will keep these observations, the three up here, and we'll encourage um, anyone that would like to come up. Um, again, stand on the blue mat. The audio is here, and um, we'd encourage you to state your name and address for the record. All right. Um, my name is Dave White, 6030 Emerson Court in Midland. Um, observations on the pedestrian environment, it's terrible. Uh, sidewalks are narrow, broken, they're way too small for game day kind of uh, levels of pedestrians. Um, those sidewalks are totally inadequate for any uh, bicycle traffic. Um, I'll just make a comment earlier. Um, uh, it was mentioned about there were no bicycles in that uh, new um, road diet environment because we purposely decided not to. Um, I was the chairman of the Non-Motorized Transportation Committee for six years. Uh, we actually counted uh, pedestrians and bicyclists um, in downtown and on those corridors, Ashman Road. And it was very significant. It is very significant. And that's why um, uh, um, there was a chart shown there with Ashman Rod and McDonald and some of the bike paths uh, there, which facilitate some of that traffic. And that's one of the reasons for uh, this study. Um, observations on vehicle traffic and the roadway. For me, and maybe I'm already prejudiced, but it seemed to me that uh, Buttles was a lot calmer, nicer to look at with just two lanes and that space which I visualize as green space than Indian which just looks like ugly concrete. Um, I think the future vision of the corridor is, uh, has been shown by all of these studies. Uh, I support that two lane road diet. I think it will lead to calmer traffic. Uh, I, I like the idea of green space there. We still do need to talk about whether that's appropriate for bike lane or a multi-use track, 
which could be used for both pedestrians and for uh, bicyclists and other non-motorized users. Um, thank you. My name is Leah Landerson, and 3405 Green Road, which despite what it sounds like, is in the city. <laughs> and um, it's a half a mile, three quarters of a mile west of Dublin Road, which is also in the city. Now, um, I've been a, a resident of Midland since 1969, uh, 1968 actually. And um, initially, when I came to Midland, I lived on Buttle Street. The other thing that I find that impacts the traffic pattern is that when I'm also a, a founding member at the Dow Diamond, and we park in the parking lot area, and when we come out of the parking lot area, we have to cross what would have been, I'm not sure, an extension, I think, of Buttles, which is not a problem because they've got that sort of slowed down there. But the pro real problem is, when you cross there, you have to take this curve around to get to Lyon. And with, since they've put the, the road diet, for lack of a better word, into effect, there's more traffic in those two lanes coming around onto Lyon, which makes it extraordinarily more difficult to get from the Dow Diamond to Indian, which is the way we want to come when we go home. And um, so I'm not real happy with that, the fact that the um, reduced lanes has made the two existing lanes much heavier traffic. Um, I come down Eastman Road to Buttles uh, fre frequently, and it's more difficult to get around into, onto Buttles if you want to make a right-hand turn to go downtown because it's, there's a very short corridor there for, for you to change lanes. Um, and my mother also lives, my 94-year-old mother lives at Riverside. And so I do a lot of going downtown um, to get to Riverside. And my personal opinion is that you're trying to crunch too much traffic. I know they said, we don't have, we have an excess of road space for the amount of traffic. But with the, with the traffic coming off the bridge and going down to Buttles and coming off of Eastman Road to Buttles, those two lanes are right away just seem to be too crowded to me. And while we were out walking, we had a, an ambulance come down Buttles. And it makes it more difficult for the people who are in front of the ambulance to get off to the side because they can only go to the left. There is no place, there is no lane on the right for them to move over. So the ambulance can go right down the, the middle lane. So I just think it would be better to have that middle lane uh, for both changing lanes and emergency vehicles. Thank you. My name is Bob Heidesack. I live on 3000 Gibson Street, Midland. And I'd like to uh, echo what Dale Anderson just said regarding emergency vehicles. It seemed like there, there were, maybe there were two emergencies. There was a fire truck came through and then within five minutes a, a, um, an ambulance came through. So or another emergency vehicle. And it was clear to me that the traffic at those, at those moments in general have a better, a much better chance of getting out of the way as Dale Anderson uh, just very clearly described. I really speak on behalf tonight of myself and three other Midland residents who could not attend, names Lynn, Kelly, and Mike. It was suggested that I follow the uh, suggestion that was in the paper. Listen carefully, I did listen. And uh, I have specific inputs for the meeting, 
from the four of us. Before I give those, I'll say that uh, can Midland be the best community that it can be? I would think one would not create a bottleneck in the business route through the city if you wanted to be the best city possible. And it makes no sense to me. It's a business route. Our three inputs are, quote, from three different people, quote, get rid of those cones, quote, unquote, this is stupid, <laughs> and quote, unquote, use all three lanes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Allison Wilcox. I prefer not to give my address out loud. I can certainly write it down and provide it for you later. Um, a couple of observations. One is, the side, as mentioned earlier, the sidewalks are far too narrow, poorly maintained. The ramps have weeds growing on them. Um, there's a lot of tree overhang, so you can't get through. Um, second, the traffic lights change too quickly. We were halfway through the light, the, the lane, halfway across the street when it started <coughs> flashing. And that meant that's the time when you need to start getting out of the road. And yet there were, I knew there were more people coming behind me. So I think a longer, longer light there. Um, one thing I've noted when I drive through that section of town, especially in the fall when the beat trucks are going through, is those trucks are big and loud and kind of scary just to drive around behind or have them drive past you. I can only imagine that would be worse if I was a pedestrian when the beat trucks and other commercial traffic was going past me, especially um, on the, the two-lane section where they would have to be squished in with other traffic. So it's, it's denser there. Um, so that is a concern. It's a concern to me that commercial traffic has to go that way. And I know there's probably not a simple solution to that to get a bypass around Midland, which we don't want a bypass per se, but that commercial traffic through town um, would be a, a problem for pedestrians, I would think, during the day. Um, let's see, and I had a third thing, another thing I was, oh, I know. Um, all the, the new buildings which have been built, uh, the Trenzio building, the condominium, and um, the, uh, the Fairfield Inn, and then the Delta College thing. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I have a feeling it'll be similar. They all seem to me to be much too close to the road. In fact, walking past the Trenzio building, I noticed there's a um, piece of plywood on the corner of that building because a car went off the road and banged into the building. It, those, uh, those buildings just seem way too close to the road for me, to me. Um, even with the sidewalks as narrow as they are, and I feel like the sidewalks need to be wider to um, accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists and, and that kind of thing. So those are my comments. My name's Art Bach. I live at 3109 Dartmouth Drive. And I came here because it's the meeting for the road diet and wanted to address my concerns. Um, one, the 60% increase in accidents from the previous nine years of accident data. Uh, it seems that the purpose of the road diet was to study the effect. And the effect is you got 60% more accidents. I guess, why does it make sense to continue to study it when you see, it, see the effect for one year and you get an increase in accidents? Now, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to all the people that get stuck in traffic passing through that corridor every day. Now, I'm also the person that originated the recall petition against Marty Wozbinski, and I'm going to have another recall petition tomorrow, and certainly brought some additional recall petitions. If anyone else is interested in signing or initiating petitions in Ward two, four, or five. So that's my thoughts on it. Hopefully the city council comes to their senses, discontinues the road diet, and uh, that, that would make the most sense. I think it would make the most people happy. So, Jump up at once. Mm -hmm. 
Good evening. Um, my name is Rhonda Lytle and I live at 411 Morningside. And um, I want to reiterate about the condition of the sidewalks, but I assume and hope that those would be repaired if this became a permanent circumstance and situation. Uh, the one thing that I didn't hear addressed was that since it's been narrowed and that right lane is absent, there's no right turn lane if you're coming down the street and you wish to turn on to Ashman to go downtown. And multiple times I've seen screeching brakes and as I'm traveling that corridor um, with people unexpecting to see, you know, those things are in the way and you can't turn early. I think Poseyville Road you can get over and turn, but I think that's the only spot that is allowed to make a right-hand transition. So um, I reiterate some of the other comments that I think it's a bad idea, but that one specifically I didn't hear mentioned, so I wanted to bring that up. Uh, Rick Luce, 310 St. Nicholas. Uh, I specifically uh, kept my eyes open I wanted to live downtown because I like what's happening I, I like the things that are going on and so I found a I found a place kept my eyes open found a place probably paid too much for it I should know better but I bought it anyhow um, just so I could be down here I've lived in Midland all my life I'm old enough to remember the dreaded Dow traffic when the whistle blew Boy, you didn't want to try to cross Bay City Road or whatever back when they had five, six, seven, I don't know the numbers, but hourly workers that were, uh, you know, like Fred Flintstone when the whistle blew sliding down the slide or sliding down the brontosaurus or whatever and heading home. Um, that's what these roads were built for was that kind of traffic when the nuclear plant had all kinds of traffic, the dreaded Bechtel 500. We don't have that anymore i drive i drive the buttle i drive buttles i drive indian i drive them all every day multiple times throughout the day i have yet to see a problem i don't i just got back from chicago which makes this even more laughable to me that we actually worry about traffic here um while i was in chicago multiple police fire whatever struggling to get through you know that and uh, and you talked about what we saw tonight and you were talking i mean come on it's laughable Th this is not a problem this is it's not a problem at all i think i think it's forward thinking um basically we can't well we could but uh, downtown isn't going to grow towards the river it's going to grow this way and to to get this prepared for that this is a step just a step in the process for the growth that's coming this way and um i don't know i don't want midland to wither and die like a lot of the downtown areas that we see in our some of our northern michigan counterparts where the train went through and now no longer the highway went through and we are we are doing things to 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 prevent that and to make midland grow and to make midland attractive to people that will help it continue to grow i i just think this is one more one more piece of the puzzle thank you Anybody else? I'm Jeff Downberg, 115 Helen Street. Um, I would echo, I think many people have said, uh, you know, talk about the condition of the sidewalk. I think regardless of what happens with the, the road design, if it's two lanes, three lanes, five lanes, you know, I think the city should prioritize fixing the sidewalks, trimming the trees, um, probably edging getting some of the, the grass off the sidewalks that that would go a long way in improving the walkability um, regardless of the of the road design um, i think similar to the to the previous speaker i was in new york city two months ago and you have two lanes of traffic going in both directions with you know bumper to bumper cars and bike lanes or pedestrian lanes on either side and somehow those those roads seem to function just fine you have semis going down you have emergency vehicles going 
I was in Washington, D.C. You have a bike lane running down the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue with, with two lanes of traffic on both sides, and there are delivery trucks on both sides. Um, you have you have, you know, obviously emergency vehicles, you have law enforcement vehicles that freely flow through those lanes. I was in San Francisco last month, and you have two, you have a main road coming off of the, the Bay Bridge that goes around the Bay to get to the Golden Gate Bridge with two lanes of traffic going in both directions um, and bike lanes in the middle, and, and cars and people can coexist. Uh, I, I've, I've shared this on, on many of the lively Facebook um, chats that have taken place. I'm sure many people have, have seen these. Um, I'm one of the few rebels that I run downtown. I, I live just off of Ashman. I run down Ashman and I run in the closed lane. I know I'm not supposed to do that, but I do it anyway. Um, sorry, and it's on camera too, so I, uh, my grandma would be very disappointed in me. But um, I, you know, I this is only my anecdotal story. I, I've I've not experienced a problem um, running next to traffic. I, I've run summer, fall, winter, spring. There's, there are no issues with debris flying off of cars, no issue with um, cars swerving. Uh, one time car swerved at me, but I think it was a, a personal matter. Um, <laughs> so, you know, g generally, I think if it was a bike lane or a, a non-motorized lane, I, I, my experience has been those, those can coexist um, next to each other. I moved to Midland five years ago. Oh, I guess one more story. Um, for Riverdale, uh, my wife is not here, so I can say this, and she'll never watch this. Um, I, I proposed walking downtown to get to, um, I think it was the Balloon Festival and River Days, and, and she looked at me like I was th uh, the craziest person she'd ever seen between walking next to three lanes coming down Ashman with car and cars fly down Ashman. I think everybody's probably seen that. And then crossing two, you know, two busy roads to get to downtown, there was no way. And I, I, I walked down, I ran downtown, she drove downtown, and I, and I beat her. So I don't know what the moral of the story is there. But before I moved to, to Midland, I lived in East Lansing and Lansing. And if, if, you, if everybody's familiar with, with that area, you have very, a very similar setup to Midland. So you have um, Oakland Street running in one direction. You have, I think it's Saginaw coming back the other direction. It turns into Grand River eventually coming to East Lansing. And it's, it's, a, a, um, it, it's a, not the most desirable neighborhoods to live in. But when you get into East Lansing, it goes from three lanes to two lanes to one lane, back to two lanes. And I'm guessing that's not by mistake, right? So when we moved to Midland five years ago, we, we ended up buying a house on, on Helen, partly because of the neighborhood and we liked the location. But we, we would have loved to live downtown, right? That's where we live and we were in, in Lansing. But the neighborhoods that are close to downtown were not the most desirable location. Um, I don't know what the, all of the factors that go into to, to creating that environment are. I'm guessing one of those is the, the road design, right? Because you have three lanes of cars flying down that are they're difficult to cross, or it can be difficult to cross depending on your ability to cross the street. Um, so I think, that's, uh, I think that covers everything. So yeah, oh, I guess my observation of the, of the ambulance coming down the street I was actually, I was happy to see there was an emergency, not happy to see the emergency field, but it was interesting to see that during the time we were out there. I didn't observe, it didn't seem to me like that I had any difficulty getting around cars. Cars moved out of the way. I grew up in a, in a small town with one lane routes in either direction and nowhere to turn off and emergency vehicles are able to, to maneuver around cars when they're, when they're getting somewhere. So uh, that was a, seemed fine to me, but yeah, okay, thanks. My name is Matt Schaffner. I live on 812 Mill. Um, I moved downtown uh, because I really liked uh, all of the plans for having a more engaged uh, community. Uh, I live three blocks from Dow Diamond, and uh, 4th of July, I, I always have a cookout at my house so my family can come and we can walk on and watch the fireworks. And uh, I've never seen so many people as nervous to walk their kids across the street as coming across the, the two one ways with all the traffic. So I think something needs to be done, uh, maybe calming, I don't know if that's the word, but uh, something done. Uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable walking my kids down that corridor that we just walked. Uh, and I don't think anybody else would. Because uh, I, you know, I think I bring a, a little different 
perspective on this than most of the people that have, that have spoken. Uh, I'm a commuter who follows or drives home on this road during rush hour uh, every day, and I really can't really, I, if I were to time my commutes, I think maybe at the worst day it adds 10 seconds to my commute. Uh, but as a resident who travels and walks and bikes downtown, I wouldn't travel this corridor. Uh, I pass through it going downtown because I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable. The sidewalks aren't big enough. Uh, so I think what it comes down to is it's, it's a matter of priorities. Uh, if we decide, you know, that we don't want a, a road diet or looking at options to change how, how traffic works and, and how pedestrians move throughout downtown, uh, then that's something that we can do. But I think if we do that, we're choosing to give something else up. Uh, we're giving up options. Uh, the world changes, demographics change. You know, the millennial generation has a different idea of how they move about. Uh, fewer from own cars. Uh, you know, growing up as somebody in the area, I remember uh, seeing, you know, going through some of the traffic of, of the one ways when Dow would let out. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it seems that things have, have changed. Uh, I see more, more traffic, you know, at work when I work in Saginaw. Uh, you know, we think we've got traffic here. Uh, there's, there's traffic there. I mean, I'm not lucky enough to travel to Chicago all that recently, but uh, it, it, it seems to me that, you know, we, we, we take, you know, if I have to tap my brakes a couple times, that's a sign that it's failed. And I look at it as if I've got to drive a little bit slower for one mile, and that means that my neighbors can enjoy the, the space more and that maybe we can expand businesses more. To me, that's a priority uh, uh, that I'm willing to give up a little something. Uh, because I, I've used this, this area for, for both reasons, as a, a local resident and as some, somebody who just wants to drive home. So uh, I'll, I'll end my uh, rambling diatribe there, but uh, uh, that's just my thoughts. You know, I, I thought that obviously we could, we could do a few things to improve. Uh, I've ridden my bike back from events downtown uh, at night and even with a, a light, to, you know, sometimes you can, the, the trees and some of the foliage can get in the way. But other than that, you know, I, I'm in favor of the study because I want to know if this really fits. By profession, I'm a process improvement consultant, so I know a thing or two about flow. Uh, so I'm, I'm analyzing all of this as well. Uh, and I know that you give up something to get something in these situations. Uh, and for me, if the traffic can sustain it and we can continue to flow traffic through, I would be really interested in the options uh, of what we can do with that space going forward. Uh, and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, so that does actually take us to eight, but I think we have a couple that just stood up. So feel free to come up and we'll continue on. I'll be brief. Um, my name is Diane Middleton. I live at uh, 1267 West Midland Road that is in Auburn so I'm not a Midland resident however uh, I work for the Midland Business Alliance we are located at 300 Rod Street which is right on the road diet so just a couple of quick points I know we're at 8 o'clock um, but I wanted to uh, actually underscore a point that Mr. Luce made about the expansion of, of downtown and the opportunity to grow to the north. And I just wanted to add on that that's the only direction that Midland can grow. It is somewhat landlocked on the south by the river, on the west by an historic <coughs> residential neighborhood, on the east um, with the ball diamond, of course. So the north is the only opportunity for downtown to grow. Now, the other thing I'd like to say is that, again, I work in a building right on the road diet. I've had a, a number of opportunities um, when I've had to go to the, the junior achievement offices across both one ways to first cross Buttles and then cross Indian. Very different experiences, very different. It's, it feels so much safer uh, crossing bottles as compared to Indian. You cross bottles, no big deal. You get up to Indian, and that traffic is just 
flying. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that reduction, uh, that one lane reduction has slowed that traffic right down, uh, made it a, a, a lot safer look and feel and experience for pedestrians, and I, I have to believe that that's going to be a good thing. So, thank you. Jackie Moeller, 2684 Ashby Road. Um, I keep hearing the people talk about the other side of Indian, they want growth. Do the people behind Indian Street realize that they're gonna be asked to be bought out? You know, because you can't do it with the houses there. That's the first thing. The other thing is when Dow took down Saginaw Road, they were transparent, they come forward, they told the people what they were gonna do, and there was really not much conflict. People weren't that upset, and if they were, they knew that it was for the best for the city. But this has not been transparent. There's been meetings behind meetings here, and I won't get into that up here, but people better realize that there's some people running the show here and this is not what it's being portrayed to be. And MDOT says one thing, they say that the city council wanted this, that they don't have the time and the manpower to go around and ask towns to do this. The council board is saying the city come to them. People want transparency, they want answers, and we may not like what we get at the beginning, but this is Midland. It's a great town to be in, and we will. We might adjust. Maybe some of us won't, but most of us will adjust. But to keep everybody in the dark and to think you know something that the rest of us don't know, we're not stupid people here. So I say, this is my opinion, let's put this on hold and start over again from transparency and let the five stakeholders let them come forward and tell the people what they want. We can't just have them thinking stuff in the back of their mind. They have to have a reason and they have to tell the people what the reason is. Otherwise, we're giving away property that the whole state of Michigan pays for, for five stakeholders. Thank you very much. Don't see anyone up, uh, else jumping up at the opportunity, but we are just a, oh, we have one hand just, raised. Just a few seconds. Yeah. I've already spoken. Sure, and we actually need you to come up just so we can get the audio for the video. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that oh, is on camera, I know. just so you know. I've been, in, <laughs> I've, been, I've been in Midland for uh, 46 years or thereabouts. And um, I, I love Midland. And I'm from a little rural town in the Thumb originally. And I came here fresh out of high school, in fact, after a semester of college. And I live in Midland because I love Midland. If I wanted to live under the conditions or the, the culture of New York or Chicago, I'd live in New York or Chicago. And I live in Midland because I love Midland. And I, want, I don't want to presume that everybody wants to live in those larger environments. More crowded, way more expensive. That's just not me. All right, we have one more, one more. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now you all want to get up and talk. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. My name is Jen Mandy Zandy. I live at 509 Rod. Um, probably the same, echoing the same observations about, that have been brought up before about um, actually the sidewalks not being pedestrian or bike friendly, um, the timing of the lights. I'd like to see while we're studying the corridor, I'd like to see some of those changes for pedestrianism implemented by the city. It seems like it'd be easy enough to clean up the trees, um, to clean up the sidewalks. The sidewalks need to be expanded. As far as observations about the vision for the future of the corridor, um, last week was the first time that I heard 
mentioned that the road diet was, you know, to, to get some more, to make more land um, for developers or, you know, to be able to expand. Um, as someone who lives right off of Indian, I would like to actually see the future vision for the corridor beyond the road, the road diet. You know, like what do you expect to be on that block between Buttles and Indian? Um, and also to kind of piggyback off of what Matt said, the extrapolation of the data, um, studying it, I'm all for that. Um, data can be manipulated, right? So maybe there's more accidents, but maybe they're less severe. Uh, we see that with roundabouts, right? Like there's more accidents, but those accidents aren't fatal. Um, so I'd like to see like a further dive into the data and maybe more public information about that data. You know, um, monthly reports, I do that for my job. <laughs> so just kind of studying that and telling the public, you know, if you have a severity scale for the accidents, the state must because they do it for the roundabout studies. Um, but overall, the vision for that, the future, I'm all for it. I wish that this could absolutely work, especially having a home right there, bought the home there to be close to the downtown. Um, the only issues I have getting downtown is the timing of the lights. So I'd like to see in conjunction, I think it would go a long way too, like with good faith, seeing some efforts by the city to also improve that mobility within the city as much as you can um, while this study is underway. So that's it. Okay. Any last takers or? With that, thank you so much, everyone, for, oh, <laughs> uh, yes, but uh, one, one arm goes up in the crowd. No. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. We're, we're very happy to have you all, and thank you for um, being able to come up and provide your commentary in that way. We think that that will provide a better um, video resource for anyone and everyone that may want to view this if they were unable to attend this evening. So I do know that staff will be around here for a few minutes, so after we adjourn, you're more than welcome to come and talk to us. Um, there's a couple of uh, meetings we do want to talk to you and draw your attention to coming up mm -hmm. on September 8th. There's a special meeting of City Council dedicated um, to t discussing Indian and Buttle Street and specifically the Buttle Street trial that's ongoing. Um, the location of that has not been determined, um, but uh, we do know it will start at 7 o'clock. And then um, if you are interested in more things going on downtown, um, we have a parking study that's ongoing. And so we kind of want to take a chance to talk a little bit about that. We have input opportunities uh, next week, Tuesday, um, for public to come and talk about parking needs going on in downtown. Um, we're a little bit excited because when you have a good things happening in your downtown, you create a parking issue, which needs to be dealt with, but yet it can also be a good thing because more people want to be down here. So um, the open house times for that, again, are it's open house, so you can drop in at any point, talk with the consultants, give some feedback. 11 to 1, sorry, 11 to 1 next Tuesday, um, and also 5 to 7, so two different time frames next Tuesday the 20th. Um, there's also online surveys available uh, that you can give your input that way also. You can find it through social media or through the downtownmidland.com website. Can you give me, I'm not real computer literate, mm -hmm. but I do have a computer. And can you give me um, a website address where I can go and find the information for all these meetings? Yes, and actually, so the question that came from the audience for those that are viewing this was a um, question related to where to find information for um, upcoming meetings and other things. Um, there's newsletters that the city put, puts out and there's emails that you can sign up for right on the city's website, which is cityofmidlandmi.gov. And I know that I said that a little fast, so um, cityofmidlandmi.gov. And ma'am, we can talk to you afterwards about what specific um, newsletters you may want to sign up for and other notifications when agenda packets go out. All right, thank you, everyone. And I think that kind of sums it up from us. So thank you all for attending.